everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, I have the honor of introducing today one of the most passionate women I've ever met, the founder of the Battery Conservancy, Wari Price. Thank you. So, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. Uh, so, first off, I want to get one thing clear. So, myself and, um, you know, I'm sure others have this misconception about the name of the park, mm -hmm. right? So, I thought that it was Battery Park. So, can you give us a little more clarity on why it should, it is just the Battery? The Battery was its historic name. And I think anyone who knows vintage music, the Bronx is up, the Battery's down. It, you know it by its location. Battery Park City is a great, wonderful, planned city. It took our name. It took our heritage. And it's really made it quite confusing. If you say to a taxi driver you want to go to Battery Park, you'll end up at the Financial Center. So the Battery is so much a part of the history of our city. It's where 7 million people a year come. They board their ferries to go to Statue and Ellis. So in building a constituency of people to care, because we'll show you a couple of before and after shots, it needed a lot of care 22 years ago when I founded the Conservancy. So if you don't know where a place is, how do you build awareness to then get people to be excited by joining in on its revitalization. So naming, building a brand, I think for profit, understand that. And as a not-for-profit, we really look like, I love this shot, because we look like we're the only green space on the island of Manhattan. So it is at the tip. We say it's the best tip in Manhattan. Uh, and it really is uh, learning to get people to say the battery and knowing it's green, knowing it's wonderful, and it's where you can have a great, unforgettable memory. So what inspired you to form the Battery Conservancy? Because, you know, the space is, is so big and it's so massive. And how, so how did you gather support and, you know, rile enough support to kind of rebuild and, and you know, beautify beaut <laughs> this amazing place? Well, there was already the private-public partnership model with Central Park Conservancy. So this was not a new uh, phenomenon or public policy phenomenon. And there was a master plan that had been funded by Battery Park City Authority. So we had the basis of a rebuilding of it. And, you know, you just get there. You, you start with nothing. We had no money. We had no board. We did the 501c3. I got a desk at the Parks Department. I had come out of being a community activist as head of a community board on the Upper East Side. I'd rebuilt all the parks on the Upper East Side. So I knew the way the system worked. But the Battery is our birthplace. It's where seven million people a year come. And it was in terrible, terrible condition, filled with asphalt. There's no green there. And now, I mean, which, which, which park would you rather visit? That is the promenade. That's the way we greeted seven million people as Americans, as New Yorkers. And that's the way we treat our historic beginnings. So we know that your first impression is something you keeps and stays with you. And I must say, the cultural heritage was not being represented very well. And now it's got beautiful gardens. The promenade is truly a welcoming sight. And I think, again, asphalt just doesn't do it. This is parkland. And one thing we did that was unique is plants. We love horticulture. We understand the importance of biodiversity. So we really did something beyond just make the park a little better. I especially love this, because they said the code engineers would never let me take down that iron railing because of the two-foot grade change. So we said, what about 30 inches of garden? And that bench is constructed out of Stony Creek granite, the same granite that's the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty, quarried 100 years later. Wow. You liked that yesterday. You sat I did. there. I was, it's all those minor details that really brings you know, every New Yorker, you feel connected to it. You know, so speaking of that, New York City has changed so much within the years. So what have you, cha um, you, know, what have you seen specifically? And also, what characteristics 
of our beautiful city did you bring into you know, rebuilding this park? This is the first century where more people live in our urban areas than rural areas. And our urban and our cities have to do a much better job of bringing nature into the lives of its citizens. We had parks, we've got Central Park. You know, we all live in our neighborhoods, which I love this saying I saw the other day on a bus shelter, naturehood. We need to make all our neighborhoods naturehoods. So with the park, bringing gardens, bringing an urban farm, bringing an aquatic understanding that we're not just Earth here, even though today's Earth Day, and I'm so happy to be here to celebrate that, but we're the blue planet. We look on to 11,000 acres of water. We measured New York Harbor. And the biggest challenge for us was how do you plant gardens next to 11,000 yeah. acres of open space? So for us in the city, what I think is we were the first waterfront park. Mm -hmm. 1693 is when it was created. When I began, we had no Hudson River Park. We had no Brooklyn Bridge Park. We had no Governor's Island. Our city has changed in the way we respect and have started to treasure our waterfronts and bringing our citizens to the water's edge. It's our new public open space. Yeah. So that's a long answer, I'm <laughs> sorry. No, that's Sue. great. You know, growing up in New York, I've really grown an appreciation for any kind of green space that you know we can access. I was born in Queens, but my father, being from the countryside, wanted me to grow up in that same environment where I was constantly seeing trees and bushes and flowers. So, you know, he ended up moving us out to Long Island where he could give us a backyard where I could see all this all the time. And it's really shaped who I've become as a person and given me a balance and, and you know, brought nature into my artwork. So can you tell me a little bit about the, the idea of um, eco-psychology and how we need that, especially here in New York with, you know, so much concrete and everything around us? Yeah. We have a wonderful saying when we started doing the urban farm. We had a sign, come get your hands in soil. And that's kind of become a little tagline for us. We have volunteer days that are incredibly moments where people can truly deal with being a part of nature. But coming and being in a space, what we say is we want everyone to come and say, where am I? Because it is so not the urban hard surface. These gardens, nature, look at this bikeway. There is nothing like this in New York as your bikeway. We said, when they, they said, how are you going to deal with 10,000 people getting off of commuter buses and the conflict safety-wise? I said, we're going to stun them with beauty. Why would you rush through the batteries gardens? So that's what I think we're doing to give people that sense of balance yes. to their emotional life, their physical life, and also respecting it and treasuring it, yeah. that we can't take our city for granted. Yes, I feel like when you see part green, it. it just makes you happier and it puts you in a better place and it gives you such a good balance, mm -hmm. right? So I know, you know, from visiting the park yesterday, I can tell that you're very passionate about it and I've seen every little attention to detail. And, you know, as an artist, I'm the same way. However, I'm the one actually executing that because I'm the one you know, executing my vision. So for you, how is it, how can you find the right, you know, landscapers or botanists to be able to execute, you know, your vision? Because like, I know you like things done very specifically in a certain way. So what's the process you go finding these artists for this big job? The first is you have to have a program, which means how are you going to use the space? If I and others haven't decided what's going to happen in the space, a designer that you will contract with will decide for you. And it's not a good idea because they come from the outside, they leave after the project's done. So the first thing for us is, why are we doing this? What is going to be the use? How are people going to be integrated into this landscape? We certainly knew the bikeway. We certainly know people like to come and sit and relax. And, but what we asked was, we wanted this to be so unique. It, we wanted the battery to become a real memorable place, 
again. It was the center of cultural life mm -hmm. of New York. And again, looking out at that harbor, which is a pretty stunning moment in your life, but having a program and knowing I wanted some food, I wanted soft surface because your feet tell you you're in a garden, the sense that the, the level of salt tolerant plants next to salt water, which really yeah. did help us a lot with Sandy and the saving of these gardens through the post Sandy period, and that perennial, they come back stronger every year. Now, is that not emblematic of New Yorkers? Don't we just keep coming back stronger? They can, you know, I started this in 94. We lived through 9-11. I had 650 National Guard soldiers in this park for, four, for a month with their trucks, everything else. We, our story is about survival. The gardens began because I wanted people that had survived 9-11 to come and be totally embraced with beauty when they came back, if hopefully they would come back mm -hmm. to that site and only be embraced with natural beauty. So program helps you define and then you find the right horticulturalists, the right landscape architects that share that vision, you see their work, uh, you do your due diligence, and then you always are involved. We have to go through public review. I go to the community, people say, what's, what's the magic? How come you never get turned down? And I said, well, I go early and often to the public yeah. because I'm doing it for the public. So our community downtown has been very supportive of what we're doing and they define how we're growing and it's certainly much more residential now than it was when we began. Mm -hmm. So you know the land is such a great space that it really could have been utilized for so many different types of things. So what was it that made you want to fill it with you know per a perennial garden? I know it's the largest perennial gardens in North America and you know like what, what was your idea behind using that? I wanted to do something that would help our environment as well as give people something that they had never been exposed to. Um, when I brought the idea to the Parks Department, and they've been such a phenomenal uh, partner, they said, but we can't afford gardeners. And I said, well, we will raise the private money to do that, but it's necessary. And I believe that labor cost of perennials I can match you dollar for dollar for shrubs and trees and lawn. There is no garden, there's no landscape that is maintenance free. Yeah. Now about our perennial gardens, we're the largest perennial gardens in North America that are free okay. and open free. to the public. Well, that's 300, very rare. Yeah, it's, it's a qualification because of course our botanic gardens all over have beautiful gardens but they're behind gates and you usually have to pay to get in. These gardens, look. These are for you to come any time of the day and enjoy. So the sense that perennials are strong, our biggest labor is divisions. We have to go in there and divide the gardens to keep them healthy. And we share them with all the other gardens. We really adopt the what we consider our green below 14, which are all our local parks below 14th Street. So everyone has fallen in love with plants. They've fallen in love with this balance of beauty. And so I'm very happy to say the parks now have many horticulturalists that are employed, that are taking this to all of our parks throughout the city. And I hope, you know, Millennium Park in Chicago has the Lurie Gardens. You know, I did bring Pete Aldoff to New York. He's the Dutch plantsman yes. that then was selected. Um, and he's our master horticultural plan. That was another thing. Parks do not have horticultural master plans. And we instituted that also. And I do think now people are looking at our public spaces and understanding that perennials, every day you go in to the park, there's something new that's welcoming you. Something new is growing. Pete really believes it's texture. It's the look of the plant. 
it's that texture green sometimes the garden is just completely green but their textural differences give them a lot of of change and as an artist i know you would appreciate that uh that change of its uh its it, the way it is formed. Yeah, I mean, the contrast of the colors and everything, it's like a work of art when you walk in there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite things yesterday when I saw was the urban farms. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just such an amazing interactive and you know educational thing for uh, both kids and residents to come. So what, cult what impact to the community has that farm you know, done? I have to give credit to eight women from Millennial, M Millennium High School uh, who are the members of the Environmental Club, who in 2011 came and said, Mrs. Price, can we have a vegetable garden? <laughs> and we had just been in construction for six years in the park for the number one subway tunnel. So there was a huge gorge in the middle, 80 trees had been taken out, and it truly was a, not an easy thing for us to see happen in the park. Yeah. So I was looking for new karma. So I said, you know, let's do an urban farm. Uh, I think we could do more than a vegetable garden. So from those eight women and uh, a lot of new soil, and we went to the Brooklyn Grange who knew how to do uh, urban farming. We did the Eagle Street, which farms on rooftops in Brooklyn, and they came to help us. And with that, we went from just those eight women to 850 students the first year with no budget, it just, I went and knocked on doors of the classes in the schools downtown, and the teachers loved it, the principals embraced it. So for us, it was a wonderful way to now have children have agriculture, all organic. Our perennial gardens are also chemical free. Um, when I was asked to be the Apple Innovator today on Earth Day, I said, you know, one of the messages I want is, You've got to keep everyone healthy. My workforce, also all the volunteers, everyone that walks through this park is never greeted with any chemicals. We have no toxin at all. And look how beautiful they are. If anything, I want everyone in their own gardens to say, you don't need to use chemicals to have your lawn beautiful. You don't need it to have plant propagation. It's the soil, it's biodiverse, it's the bugs. You know, yes, it you truly know is what makes it. And the urban farm has brought a whole new realization to eating fresh. The children eat the food that they grow. I've had more parents say, I never dreamed my child was going to be eating radishes. I said, well, it's our go-to seed. It germinates in 30 days. You plant that seed, 30 days later, you're eating a radish. So it's our real first plant we do, <laughs> and the children loved it and it's been it's our sixth year we're now have 106 schools engaged in the program and almost wow. 5,000 students that's annual. amazing so, yeah and uh, you know speaking of of kids I um yesterday rode the sea glass carousel for the oh. first time and it was beautiful not only beautiful but it really captures I think the essence of what I would feel like being underwater and I and I'm a huge lover of the ocean so can you tell me about what went into designing the aesthetics of that beautiful carousel? And you know, how would you, how'd you capture channeling that underwater experience for kids? Uh, light. We were looking for something light-filled to engage people from the street to come into the park. And so the landscape artist said, what about a merry-go-round? And the architect on the team said, if you do one, you were the home of the first aquarium, 1896. You have got to do an aquarium carousel. What's that? 15 seconds? Yeah. 11 years later, 8 million private matched with 8 million public money. We have the sea glass carousel. 30 bioluminescent fish welcome children. And WXY were the architects that did the building, which is the Nautilus chamber, the chamber Nautilus shell, which is not, it's much more than a shell. We know it's a living organism. And 30 wonderful fish, many of them were in the first aquarium. So now, George Seepin's Opera Factory it was a set designer for, mm -hmm. the, for the show inside. And he said he didn't want the children to ride fish. He wanted children to be fish. So you see how you sit inside? These fish are nine feet by nine feet. There is one fish that's 13 feet tall. 
So the monumentality of the fantasy that we bring into children and adults, there we, we, we host everyone. This is not just for young children. These, as you can see, the sense of its magic, it's a cultural happening. There are 77 fixtures on that light ring up at the top. If you come in day, you gotta promise me you'll come back at night because the real sense of beauty and excitement is not just a happy face peeking through a porthole there in that fish, but look at the nighttime show. It really gives you the magic. And the idea of a three minute ride is to feel the magic of the undersea world, to go from the garden, mm -hmm. being in a park, to the depth of the ocean, exploring and then assuming back out into the park. Yes. So I hope, I do think children are getting a much more important understanding uh, because our waters in New York are naturally dark. Mm -hmm. So we can't, even if we could scuba dive or snorkel, you wouldn't see much. Yes. But at sea glass, we think we truly are dealing with our underwater life and beauty. Yes, it is beautiful. I have to go back there at night. You know, it's, it looks completely different. It is. And the bioluminescence, just to have another plug for science, fish do naturally change color in the wild. When a human is, is swimming close to them, of course, they do not do this. So at sea glass, you can really understand how amazing. This is not artificial and just theatrical. Yeah. The fish truly do light in the wild. And again, a beautiful garden. So can you tell me a little bit about the process that, the, that you guys go through when you want to redesign a certain section of the park or rebuild that part? Well, I've got a concept up. Uh, we're about 95% complete of the built landscape. It's 25 acres. The last major piece is what we call the battery plays, which is a playground. We're tripling the size, and again, I wanted it to be filled with nature, fill it with horticulture. Look at the five granite slides coming off of the Adventure Bluff. It is also filled with plants. Children should feel the sense of geology, um, also challenge, physical challenge, um, and to be in a woodland or be outdoors in nature, not a hard surface cement play space. Mm -hmm. we, we wanted to do something and we're using incredible beautiful materials that will be sustainable and maintainable. But we also are growing all these plants right now in the nursery in an area of the park. So we know we're doing them chemical free, propagating them properly. So when we put them in, they'll be stronger than if we'd bought them from a nursery. The other thing is we wanted sand and water. We want them to understand filtration, water coming in from stormwater management. So the sense of what is a resilient playground. So that was important to us. So the architects we chose, BKSK, had done the Queen Science Center playground, which is wonderful teaching various parts of uh, balance, physics, and, and, and science. Ours will incorporate much of that. These are tree houses. And the one I love is the cliffhanging one over off the Venture Buff. It's for handicapped children to be able to communicate with the lacing together of the bridge work of the, of the landform um, uh, houses. So it gets you to climb, to be up high in the trees uh, without touching the trees and looking out at the harbor. The other thing we wanted was, you see the little market houses, improv, yeah. imaginative play in playgrounds or a house. Well, we said, gosh, what about a theater for improv? It means New York. <laughs> Thank you, exactly. So it's a puppet theater, but it's open all the time and children can become the puppets and as well as uh, performers. So if a parent or a teacher comes with a guitar, or if all the kids bring their recorders and they want to perform, or if they've made puppets in the classroom yeah. and want to come, we now will have what we call the Jewel Box Theater for the Children, and it's really quite an amazing structure. You see it there, it's, it's a 14 by 14 structure, and we're very fortunate to have Cheryl Henson from the Jim Henson Foundation working with us on it, as well as Basil Twist. So again, picking experts. Yes. 
finding them in New Yorkers are truly the most generous people in the world. So we are uh, lucky that we have a quantity of experts here and generous yes. experts. Yes. So we're very lucky. <laughs> Uh, the, the Battery is one of the first, if not second place, you know, you see when you enter New York City. The Staten Island Ferry is right there. You know, what do you want both New Yorkers who are residents or tourists who are coming here the first time, what do you want them to feel when they first enter the Battery? And it's very overwhelming and beautiful. I just want them to say, wow, what is this? I must say, one day when I saw Turing family take their children's pictures in the garden before they went to the water's edge and took it with the statue behind, I went, <laughs> yes, I'm at parody with the lady in the harbor. That's what I want them to s look at us and say, look at that urban farm. They're doing it here in the financial center. Shouldn't we go home to our community? Mm -hmm. Part of it is that drew me to the project is manageable space, high volume. The ability to market the values that we believe in so strongly, yeah. our nature values, our public space, our civic ideals, um, and have people take that away and take them back to their own communities. Mm -hmm. So one is, first of all, have a grand time and build wonderful memories and come back often. But the other is, why shouldn't I take this home to my own community? And it's not we want to, we don't want to be preachy or, you know, we're so great, but it is a way of imparting the values that I think we brought, which is great yeah. design, which I really commend Apple for also bringing to the public great design. Yes. Uh, one of the phrases I coined was aesthetic literacy. The way taste literacy is my urban farm phrase mm -hmm. to get children to really be knowledgeable on taste of real food. Well, design, the quality, it's what, how do you teach aesthetic, or how do you become aesthetic literate? Yeah. It's because you're exposed to it in your public domain, in, in your parks, in the signage, in the bus shelters. I must say I love all our new bus shelters and the street furniture that we now have in New York. And um, so the, the aspect of what do I want people to take away? A lot. <laughs> But first of all, just to be happy. Yes. You know, we touched on it a little bit before, but New York has been, you know, through some very traumatic times, including, you know, 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy. And I just kind of want to get a, you know, exactly what you, how it impacted and the steps that you took in being able to rebuild and, and come out stronger like all New Yorkers do. And then there was another thing that yesterday we spoke about, how they were trying to build the subway right through the park and how you had to take them to court. So talk a little bit about the obstacles you know, that you've had to face. Well, after 9-11, there was, um, thankfully, um, quite a bit of federal money for infrastructure improvement. And the number one is the only partial platform. We all, have, any of us, you have to be in the first five cars. And so definitely making that up to the code of all the other subway stations was important. It was very important to downtown. But the MTA's first plan was to have the tunnel as well as all the new stations smack dab in the park where I have sea glass now. And I went, uh, I think this is called alienation of uh, parkland. Oh no, this is you know park improvement. I said, you know, I'm, I'm not, I agree that we need to improve the number one. Mm -hmm. But I do not agree giving up almost an acre of public space for the stations and the, the sense of arrival and yes. what you need to do. So quietly, behind the scenes, we went to all the public officials. I also did go to NRDC. Got to have them in your pocket also. <laughs> and we did have the body of law behind us. And really, after you really explained that you have the opportunity to build a transportation hub of the 21st century. Where do subways connect with ferries? Just tell me. Hong Kong, maybe? No. Taiwan? No. I mean, New York had the opportunity at the number one at Staten Island, at that plaza, to bring bikes, buses, subway, and ferries to one space. And guess what? We won and they did it. 
So when you, we're now going to open in mid-June, the new number one, as you know with Sandy, it all got destroyed. All the years of work I've had will finally take the final fences down okay. uh, in June. So, so it was a quiet battle. Uh, we knew the public officials really, after we reminded them of what, how important this, yes. this public space is, uh, it was more challenging engineering on their side. It was more costly, and the engineering was much more difficult. We had to dig under the number four. Remember, the battery, this 25-acre, all the plantings you've seen, those mature trees, you have the Battery Brooklyn Tunnel, 40 feet below. You have the underpass, which brings the FDR to the West Side Highway. You've got the four and the five, the RW, the number one, yeah. all wow. underneath this park so of course there's always someone doing something with some light shaft air shaft you know uh underneath our park but but for now there's no more space yeah so we don't have to worry about any more <laughs> incursions uh and i must say um we worked well with as it, i explained the urban farm came out of losing 80 trees so we did have to have the tunnel but it closed up. Mm -hmm. We now have beautiful meadows there and woodland. And we have on the perimeter of the park and at the plaza in front of Staten Island, all the subway stations. Okay. <laughs> You've clearly designed um, the Battery to be one of the most sustainable gardens in the city. So now you've created this beautiful space. So now how do we make this place a home and it, our backyard? and? How can we bring the community and different cultures? So like, what do you have in terms of programming plan to bring more people in and just to bring culture to this place? Well, the most important is what they call activation. And we haven't really had this asset base until now. So we really are ready to go prime time and say, <laughs> come on, everyone. Do you, why would you go somewhere else when you can sit in this beautiful garden? And we have a uh, farm to table uh, kiosk. Uh, um, that you can have all organic food for lunch. So it's a special place, and one is getting the word out, such things as today, being here, focused on, on the park on Earth Day. Volunteer days bring a lot of people into the park, recognition. Um, and then social media will help us. But the most important thing is we love to do fairs. Yes. And we did a small batch entrepreneur fair where we designed our own market uh, stands. Mm -hmm. And they, they encircled 90,000 square foot oval lawn, which is a beautiful way to come together, to organize and be in public together. It's three times larger than the quad at Bryant Park. And we know how successful that's been to 42nd Street. So one is doing fairs, inviting people in for special events, and building a group of people to say, hey, what's happened at the Battery this weekend? Yeah. So that's our future, but also we welcome everyone to come volunteer Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays, which also, if you've gotten your hands in soil there, you're certainly getting to know the real value and the beauty. And I think um, once you come once, it's so easy on your bike to get there. Yeah. Our subway, I mean, we're probably one of the most accessible, wonderful gardens in the five boroughs or in the whole Northeast region. So uh, getting the word out. Yeah. Will you help me? <laughs> of course I will. Oh, so, you know, that brings me to my last question, which is, you know, I, I believe the first step is always an awareness and appreciation. So then now how do we get people involved and and you know what advice do you have to give to anyone who's interested in you know um part and being more involved in park conservation and and planning and you know like what you do first of all you've got to be aware don't walk around with your eyes and your mind closed really look at the built environment that you live in and I know we all have become very much interconnected technologically, but we also know um, nature means a lot to our emotional development and our, and our physical health. I mean, so that's first and foremost. First we need and the foremost, we need this. And I think people take And I think um, today, Earth Day, I say, think globally, act. No, yeah, 
think globally, act locally. Your neighborhood needs you. Whether it's a window box, whether it's a tree pit, there's so many ways to get involved and be a part of your living environment. So there are many uh, friends groups. Mm -hmm. Start it yourself. I mean, like I said, I started this with nothing, but knowing that I was incredibly embarrassed as an American that this was one of the first places people from around the world visited, the tip of Manhattan. Yeah. So I think it's one, uh, knowing that you can make a difference. And there is nothing insignificant about taking and improving your environment you live in. Whether you volunteer with someone, whether you're just you know, sweeping out in front of your apartment building, you know, always putting the trash in a receptacle. These are things that I think we can all do in the day-to-day -day ways we, you know, we live in this city. And it is becoming more and more concentration on people. Yeah. And, um, and I do think I love seeing everyone on their bikes. I love the, the sense that people do care about the carbon footprint. I mean, our awareness today, since I began the battery, is like decades, decades mm -hmm. of people's understanding. But come to the battery, look at this, and know you can make a big difference. It's just making that commitment, having a vision. You do have to kind of sometimes know what you would prefer to happen there. It helps. Yeah. Uh, but then it's sharing that and sticking with it. I think there's a real way we talk about uh, starting these public-private partnerships that you have to give it five years. New initiatives, you have to give it five years. If it doesn't take off after five years, we'll let you try something else. <laughs> but five years is a very good measure of is this going to go or not. That help? Yes, of course. So, you know, from what I take away, so for everyday people, I mean, you just have to remember nothing is too small. Like just yesterday, I saw you pick up a plastic bag off of the ground and just like little things like that. If everyone did one minor thing like that, it would uh, create such a change already. It's the first steps. Yeah. yeah. So, does anyone have any questions for Worry? So, yesterday you said the battery is about people's beginnings. And that statement really resonated with me. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more about how that's been a thought throughout the beginning for you and then to your vision and then programming in the future. The premier essence of a landscape that has been inhabited for 11,000 years. The Munzi Indians were our very first native tribes, part of the Delaware Nation. And they didn't last long. They're now located in Ontario. But the value systems of those first footsteps have stayed with me really strongly to the point that across the street from us is the Museum of American Indian. And we're going to do a Native Arts Fair to celebrate our Northeastern tr tribes all the way from Canada down the, the coast. Um, so those first footsteps 11,000 years ago that this land was inhabited and we fished from the banks to the first uh, explorers. Giovanni Veranzano in the 1500s described it in his diaries. Um, then Henry Hudson, working with the Dutch in 09, where they celebrated 400 years from the time Hudson came in. The, that, the scale of the harbor, its welcomingness, and the first land, in a sense, that was made a settlement. Um, the other part is we've never left our roots. Much of our country's settlements were religious freedom based. We were always about commerce. <laughs> we were always about trade. And we've never left our origin. So, and of course the, the business community that's there now and now we're going into residential uses and nature based neighborhood. Uh, it's evolving, but it's history, it's origin, <clears throat> that sense of our beginnings. Um, we hosted the march on the weekend of the um, immigration executive order. It was a spontaneous mar uh, assemblage of 10,000 people. And my, you know, everyone said, oh my gosh, did they ruin the park? You know, we didn't, we weren't prepared. You know, the executive order was Friday. The 
the lawyers were out at the port of entry at all our major international airports throughout our country. And on Sunday, 10,000 people are at the Battery. Why? Castle Garden, the, that wonderful building where people get their tickets, the statue now, was the first immigration station run by the state of New York of where no one was ever turned away. Nine million people came to Castle Garden. So again, those footsteps, that history, it all resonated with, we've got to tell these stories. And I, I was a kind of concerned. Our gardens got trampled a bit, and, but everyone was safe, and it was the right thing to happen at the Battery. That's where people should have been to voice the freedom of their feelings that day. Free speech, coming together there on any issue that a person wants to speak about. But that day was certainly, because of its history, a very appropriate thing. So I'm reminded, and I think today we leave such a fast pace in our, all over the country, and certainly with technology, it seems to be speeding us up a bit. So authenticity, our origins, our beginnings, give us a little bit. You know, we have castlegarden.org, which is a database free for you to look up your ancestors if you think they came in before Ellis and you think they came from the, into the port of New York. And the traffic we get, people tracing back their family history, that people do care about how we began and how are we proceeding. We'll always be trying to improve, at least I believe, and in public service, the lives of people. So how I can do that with just 25 acres, but remember, manageable space, high volume. It's a very good maxim it's still going to be a lot for us to maintain this landscape because we really have built it so beautifully. But I do think people do want to come and be a part of it. But um, I think its history and its significance uh, cannot be diminished at all. So I really thank you for that question. How could someone volunteer at the Battery? And also, what kind of volunteer work could someone do at the Battery? <clears throat> we are now so lucky. We went from like eight volunteers to a hundred. Um, we found that volunteers want structure. They want to be there on such and such a day. And the most valuable volunteers for us are those that have already been trained. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're with our top gardeners. If you want to learn about perennial gardening, and as I said, it's a safe place. We have no chemicals there. So we treasure our volunteer hands as well as our own employees. And so nature-based volunteering. We also today uh, have Comcast in the park. Six, 60 of their employees are celebrating Earth Day with us. And they'll be oiling benches to be sure that we sand them and oil them. Um, there will be painting some of the iron work, but, but we put a lot of drop cloths down. Uh, the, the, the sense of, of uh, uh, transferring soil. We loosened up the soil and, and put down new topsoil last weekend. So a lot of it is caring for that landscape and, imp and cleaning it, uh, doing really things you would do in your own garden to, to oh, welcome spring. And then just uh, fixing bench slats or doing survey work for us. You know, even though I say, 25 acres is manageable, I go in there and I see, why didn't you know that that slat was broken over there, you know? So it's, it's also doing survey work, saying, oh, <clears throat> this is Price, over here you need to replace such and such. So taking a sticker off, I don't know why people want to put stickers on everything, but we have to take them all off of wherever they put them on, the light fixture, the railing, but there, there, there's, you know, we, we also clean for, anything that doesn't belong there, graffiti or stickers or, um, you know, uh, anything else is, in a sense, defacing the beautiful stone. But I must say, people said, how is it people do not steal these plants? I said, because they don't want them, it not to be beautiful. People do respect beauty. And I think that's another thing, that word is not a fancy word. It's a necessary word. I had the great fortune to be men mentored by Lady Bird Johnson since I was 18 years old. And Mrs. Johnson always said, plant millions of flowers where the millions pass. 
and that was her wonderful wildflowers along all the highways, byways of our country today, as well as in Washington, D.C., along the flowering trees along the West Side Highway, or looking over to Governor of uh, Roosevelt Island and seeing all those beautiful cherry trees. Um, and I think that aspect of really honoring beauty and uh, and we, we, we just can't stop. And people do respect it and care for it. But we will need help. Um, and we know that people will grow and it'll be wonderful for them to, as we say, get your hands in soil. Come be with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I want to thank everyone for coming out today. And thank you, Wari, for joining us. I hope that with this discussion, you will have grown a deeper appreciation for not only the battery, but you know, all parks in general. And um, don't take green for granted, right? <laughs> Thank you.